Good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. Peter's, to our service of evening worship. Uh, welcome to those of you who are here now, um, and welcome to those who are joining us online. It's particularly good to have you uh, as part of this act of worship from wherever it is that you might be joining us. And if you are following uh, online, I'm told that uh, the text of the service is also easily available via the uh, church's website. So uh, to get our service underway, I'm going to hand over to Karen to lead uh, the first part of our prayers and liturgy. Thank you, Karen. Good evening, and uh, may I add my welcome to John's as we come together this evening to worship God, either here in person or at home online. So shall we just be quiet for a moment and allow him to fill us with his presence? Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude and to listen to your word with eagerness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. That this evening may be holy, good and peaceful. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Amen. And now we are going to sing God's praise in song.
It's time now to say sorry to God for anything that we've done or said to hurt others this week and by doing so hurting him and also to let go of anything that we need to let go of. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world and knows our every word and deed. Let us then open ourselves to the Lord and confess our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, our Maker and Redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and save us. We have willfully misused your gifts of creation. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have condoned evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. May God, who so loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let it, together, let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And Cynthia will now bring us our Old Testament reading. The reading is Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning, beginning to read at verse 24. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave my servant, Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. And I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is from the New Testament, from the book of Acts, chapter 12. Peter's miraculous escape from prison. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. 
After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gates leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for what we read there and pray that these things which were written down so long ago may continue to speak to us now and show us how in our lives we may draw closer to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When we read the story of the early church in the book of Acts, it's quite easy and very tempting to look back on this period of the church's history as a kind of golden age, a time when <clears throat> Christians were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they got everything right, and it would have been great and wonderful to have been there uh, amongst all of it. And in some ways, that's probably true. 
because much of, the, much of what God was doing was remarkable in those times. But it's important that we remember as well that these men and women were in so many ways just like us. They were ordinary men and women who had been chosen to witness and sometimes to do great things for God. And we also find in these chapters evidence of the humanity of these people. They weren't by any means perfect. They were still learning about all the things which God wanted to show them. Now, this story in Acts chapter 12 about Peter getting out of prison is probably a very good example of that and showing us how the church wasn't really perfect. We see it, I guess, in Peter himself in the first part of the chapter. Peter has been captured because Herod actually intends to put him to death. It's Passover time. We don't know how many Passovers this was after the Passover when Jesus was, was crucified and raised from death. Uh, probably uh, several years at least, if not quite a few years. But this is an important time. It's uh, like uh, being in prison at Christmas, I suppose. It can't have been much fun for Peter added to which that this was a very squalid Roman prison and that there were Roman soldiers crawling all over it. This wasn't a very pleasant moment. Now, if there was a miracle that was going on in the midst of all that, it probably was that we're told that Peter was asleep. He was sleeping very soundly, despite the fact that the prison was crawling with Roman soldiers and that he was probably going to die the next day. I'm not sure if I knew that I was going to die tomorrow, I would be sleeping very soundly in the way that Peter was. But we've heard what happens, that it's while he's asleep, it's in the middle of the night, that an angel appears in the prison and rouses him from his sleep and says, come on, we need to go, you know, put your cloak around you, we're going into Jerusalem. And so Peter does what the angel says, finds that the chains that he's been chained up in just fall off, and out he goes. But, we are told, he didn't think that what was happening to him was real. He thought that this was all happening to him in a trance or a vision. I guess that that's probably understandable as well, because we've seen even quite recently in the stories about Peter that uh, some very remarkable things did happen to him in visions. He had had a vision uh, in Simon the Tanner's house of, of, this unclean, of unclean animals coming down in front of him. Uh, it's a story we looked at a bit last week. And so he had had experiences like that before. This time, of course, it wasn't a vision at all. It was really happening to him. And it's only when he's completely out of the prison and in Jerusalem itself that the angel just vanishes and leaves him and he realizes, wow, I, I'm free, I'm, I'm out. And he sort of comes to himself and thinks, gosh, this is really happening to me. And no, we, we, we don't read a story here about him saying, well, you know, obviously, you know, God has sent his angel to rescue me. Well, he, he does say something like that, but it still takes him a little bit to realize that these remarkable things are happening to him. Now, when we turn our attention to what the church is doing while all that's going on, we find another remarkable example of it. The church knew that it was right to pray for Peter. He was in a pretty bad place, really. He was the leader of the church at this time. He's probably going to die the next day. So it's understandable that they gathered to pray for him. And they're praying for him regularly. They're praying through the night. Their commitment is in many ways commendable. 
But then, of course, Peter goes to the house where they're meeting and praying, knocks on the door and asks to be let in. And we have this scene where Rhoda, the servant, comes to the door, hears that it's Peter, and goes back to report it to the people who are praying, who say, of course it can't be Peter. You know, you must be, you must be dreaming. This isn't Peter. And while they're praying, praying presumably that Peter will be rescued, when their prayers are answered, they don't realise that their prayers have been answered. They just carry on praying. And it's only after they've checked it a few times that they let Peter in and begin to celebrate the fact that God has answered their prayers as they presumably expected him to, to begin with. <clears throat> this is not a story about a perfect church who uh, wanted to present to the world the fact that the moment they prayed, God sent his angel and got Peter out of jail. This is people who had uh, somehow uh, started to pray, knowing that prayer was important, but when God answered their prayer and the answer was staring them in the face, they still didn't quite believe it and needed several goes to try and realize the importance and the, uh, <clears throat> the, the outstanding nature of the miracle that had just happened. Now, having said all that, <clears throat> it's against that background that we have to ask ourselves how this story can maybe speak into our own situation. And what we need to be challenged by here. Here's a story that happened some years after Pentecost and probably some years after many of the remarkable events recorded in the book of Acts. Here's a church which has got used to being together and has developed a kind of committed church life where they're praying for each other and when Peter is arrested and put in jail, they meet together, they're going to pray for him, even if the worst happens. All of that's great and good, but they've lost sight of the fact, a little bit, that here is a God who wants to work miracles. Here is a God who wants to act decisively and very remarkably in their midst. And I wonder if it's the case that sometimes with prayer, we always say, don't we, that, that prayer is really important and that it needs to be amongst the church's priorities and there's, there's nothing wrong with that and all of that remains true. But I wonder whether sometimes we can lose sight of the fact that God wants to work in the way that he does in this chapter that prayer for us becomes a little bit of a pietistic routine if we are not careful. And <clears throat> sometimes we can be praying for things and God intervenes and does something remarkable. And like the early church in this story, we're still kind of praying for it when the answer is staring us in the face. The God's who we worship is a God who throughout Scripture does miracles and remarkable things. And so we need to beware that we don't lose sight of that altogether and start worshipping a God who is great and uh, wonderful, but actually doesn't do very much on a day-to-day -day basis in our lives. And we lose sight altogether of the fact that here is a God who is prepared to do miracles in our midst as well as much as he was in the midst of the early church. Like the early church, we're only human. And we come to that place sometimes. And sometimes God needs to do something like this in our midst to 
jerk us out of our complacency and to show us that we need to be much bolder in a lot of the things that we pray for, as well as praying perhaps for those who are sick. Are we prepared sometimes to ask them whether we can pray for them very specifically, for actually for God to do something much more specific and remarkable in terms of bringing them healing? What kind of situation, like Peter being locked up in the way that he was, do some of us in the church still face today? And when that happens, as well as asking the church to pray and asking our groups of friends, our home groups and so on to pray for us, are we really expecting God to do something of this nature that he did at Passover time remarkably to set Peter free? Let's be sure that as we continue to develop habits of prayer in our lives, it doesn't just turn into a kind of pietistic routine, but that we too are making space for a God who is much bigger and much more powerful than that, a God who wants to be living and active in our lives, so that from time to time these kinds of things begin to happen in our midst as well. So let's pray together. When I say, Lord, receive our praise, will you respond with, and hear our prayer? Lord, receive our praise, and hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are that powerful and almighty God who can work miracles amongst us. As we come before you now in prayer, we pray for the situations in our lives where we need to see your miracles. Build our faith in you, Father, during these days. As we learn more about what you did in the early church, grant us by your Holy Spirit to expect to see those things happening in your church, in your world, in our lives. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the church tonight. We pray for all those who have been given leadership responsibility. This weekend especially, we pray for those who are being ordained, particularly those ordained as priests, later than they might have expected. But we pray that your, your hand will be upon them and upon their future ministry within your church. We pray for all those who already have leadership responsibility in the church, for our archbishops and bishops, our vicars and other leaders, for those in the lay who have responsibility for leadership. For each one of us, Lord, as we form your people here and now, help us to be able to see with your eyes where the needs around us are. Help us to look for the unexpected, to see the places where you want to work that we may not imagine. Help us to see what you are doing among your people in this time and to be ready to join in. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for our society in this country. We pray for all those who have responsibility for leadership locally in our community. We pray especially this week for our local council here in Bradford. We pray for Susan, the council leader, for all others who have elected responsibility for all officers of the council. In these difficult days, Lord, give them wisdom. Help them to choose to put the weakest and the most vulnerable first. Help us all to be ready to play our part, however difficult that is, to keep the virus under control in our city. 
We pray for governments around the world. We ask for your wisdom and your justice and righteousness as they make decisions on behalf of their people. We pray particularly for the United States of America as the election comes up there over the months and weeks to come. Lord, by your spirit, move amongst the people of that country and may your will be done in the outcome of that election. As we come towards harvest, we pray for your world and for the way in which we use and abuse it. In these difficult times, it has often been hard to put the environment first, to take care of your creation as you would have us do. So Lord, as we come to the time of year when we celebrate all that you have created and given to us, give us a new vision for taking care of your world. Show us what it is that we can do to be better stewards of the world that you have created and given to us. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. We pray for all people who are in need tonight of any kind. And in a moment of quiet now, let's bring to mind anyone known to us who is struggling in any way, whether that is in body, in mind, or in spirit, and ask God to come close and touch them tonight. Lord, we leave these who we love and you love in your hands tonight. As we pray for them, make our wills eager to obey you and our hands ready to heal. Lord, receive our praise and hear our prayer. Lord of life, hear our prayer and make us one in heart and mind to serve you with joy forever. Amen. And the collect uh, for today, the 16th Sunday after Trinity. O oh Lord, we beseech you mercifully to hear the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfill them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And let's pray together now in the words that our Saviour gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we're going to praise God in song again now.
Lord, you have brought us through this day to a time of reflection and rest. Calm us and give us your peace to refresh us. Keep us close to Christ that we may be closer to one another because of his perfect love. In his name we pray, the almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.